Okay, I think we can get started. Uh, I'm Fred Murphy. I work with the Marxist Education Project. Uh, we're very glad this afternoon to have uh, a return visit from the Working Group on Globalization and Culture from Yale University. Uh, I believe this is the third or perhaps the fourth uh, time that uh, the MEP has welcomed uh, the Working Group, and they're always extremely interesting and stimulating and uh, creative uh, sessions. Uh, we're very glad to have everyone here. And at this point, I'd just like to turn uh, the, the, the meeting over to Maru Pabon, who will chair on behalf of the working group. And uh, we will uh, get started. So over to you, Maru. Thank you, Fred. And thank you, everyone, um, for, for being here and joining us. My name is Maru Pabon. And good afternoon. Um, thank you for joining us for a session today. As Fred said, we are the Working Group on Globalization and Culture, an interdisciplinary cultural studies laboratory made up of faculty, graduate students, and postdoctoral scholars that has been practicing collective research at Yale since 2003. Our methods are a bit unorthodox. Together, we work to select a keyword for the academic year that connects our thinkings across time periods, regions, practices, and knowledges. This keyword reflects shared commitments and concerns across the group. Some of us will make arguments about the potency and shortcomings of the keyword. Others will integrate the keyword into pre-existing genealogies or individual research agendas. We are pleased to return virtually to the Marxist Education Project where we presented state forms and form states last year. We also spoke about resources and relations the previous year and use uh, during the a presentation on a user's manual four years ago. This year, we have looked at the fallout of war, war being our keyword. Most of us have come of age in an era that has proclaimed both the end of the Cold War and the onset of endless war, forever war, infinite war, global war, galactic war, wars unbounded by time or space. So we seek to explore the way war has marked bodies and minds, landscapes and languages, the mundane militarisms of everyday lives and places. War, what is it and what is it good for? War might seem like a foregone conclusion or a state of exception. In either case, it is an archetype of crisis. Trade wars can become militarized and hot wars can look cold, depending on your vantage point. The race war, Twitter tells us, is impending. But in an age of U.S. forever wars, understanding war as, a, as punctuating the flow of history seems to be entirely insufficient. War is, some argue, a way of life, a structuring condition that shapes your examinations of the history of the present. The war on drugs, the war on poverty, the war on COVID, the war on Christmas. War is also a ubiquitous metaphor, a self-righteous idiom that announces moral panic and articulates racial logic in otherwise terms. But metaphors of war have also influenced various radical traditions and social movements, including anti-war activism and Gramsci's deployment of metaphors of war, this theorizing of hegemony. Taking account of war as constitutive of the present, the working group explores war's meanings as event, analytic, and metonym. The project is divided in two halves. Today, the chronologies of conflict considers the histories of war and empire from the U.S. Civil War to the metaphors of war and black poetry, from Japanese Mexicans and Japanese Americans on either side of the U.S.-Mexico border during World War II to the sitcoms of the global war on terror. On Saturday, May 13th, next week, from 2 to 4, the second half, Metonyms of Militarism, explores the fallout of militarism in everyday life and culture, moving from the Marshall Islands to South Korea's Han River, and bridging cultural resistance in 60s Palestine with the present day US culture war. Five of us will present the first half of our project today. The other half will present the second half next week. Each of us will talk for about 15 minutes. And finally, as this is a single collective presentation, we ask that you save your responses for the end. Thank you very much. Thanks, Maru, for introducing us today. Um, to get us started, I'll reflect on teaching civil wars over the past semester. I know that I don't dream of labor. I know that teaching, certainly not in the crumbling humanities academy that my peers and I fear, resent, and inherit, is not a calling but a profession, an increasingly precarious one at that. 
But I teach my first seminar and I dream of my favorite teacher, Anne, who advised me in my master's program and died a few days before I moved to New Haven to begin my doctoral studies. She hugs me out of classroom door. She's peeking in in search of extra chairs for her own classroom. She tells me that I'll find my voice as a teacher and that my students will see that I care. She cared and she was rigorous. She gave me a B minus in the grad seminar I took with her during my first semester of my master's. I resented it, but we met weekly in an independent study in the semester that followed. And every week she gently and invisibly guided my thinking. I seek advice from mentors in this realm and everyone shares the tricks of the trade that they've picked up over the years. I don't dream of labor, but sometimes I'm compelled to. Next slide, please. I assign the classics. We start our first class with Marx's chapter from Capital on the Working Day, as good a way as any to encounter Marx for the first time, as many of my students were. It strikes me as I prepare for class that not only is the chapter of Marx at his most exciting, he's funny, he gives us memorable characters like Marianne Walkley, the milliner who dies of overwork, and he's on fire with his anger. It's also a chapter about civil wars. Marx describes the centuries long battle over the creation of a normal working day as a protracted and more or less concealed civil war, which is to say a class war between the capitalist class and the working class. The structure of the chapter reflects this characterization as Marx moves between the voice of the capitalist and the worker to narrate the centuries long battle over the working day as capital innovates exploitation by inventing new tricks to maximize the extraction of surplus value, lengthening the working day, inventing the 24 hour production process, exploiting child labor, workers fight back. The factory inspector's report makes the voice of the worker audible. The state is the site of struggle. As I prepare for class, I realize that civil war moves beyond metaphor though, as the American Civil War casts a persistent shadow throughout the chapter. The famous civil war that decided the fate of slavery in the United States South heightens the power of Marx's metaphor. Slide, please. As Raya Donevskaya notes in her 1958 essay on the impact of the civil war in the United States on the structure of capital, Marx fundamentally revised what would become volume one of capital in the years during and after the American Civil War and the end of slavery in the US South. She notes his famous remark that the American Civil War sounded the toxin for the European working class as the American War of Independence did for the European middle class a century earlier. She quotes his equally famous letter to Abraham Lincoln written on behalf of the First International in which he remarks that the white work North had been, quote, unable to attain the true freedom of labor or to support their European brethren in their struggle for emancipation until the Red Sea of Civil War had eliminated slavery as a barrier to progress. The American Civil War, Danievskaya suggests, revealed to Marx the shape of, quote, new impulses from the workers, specific to the heady 1860s after the quiet 1850s followed the suppression of the revol revolutions of 1848. While the 1850s yielded Marx's 1859 contribution to the critique of political economy, the movement to end slavery in the 1860s prompted Marx to revise his critique to give an account of capital that not only registered the history of theory, but also the history of workers' resistance to capitalist exploitation. Next slide, please. Enter the chapter on the working day, which Danievskaya points out, Marx did not draft until 1866. Here, instead of staging arguments with other theorists as he did in his critique, Marx enters the realm of the labor process. As a result, the story he tells, consisting of overwhelmed factory inspectors, adulterated bread, and workers who die prematurely, is the history of the social relations of production, and as such, a history of freedom. He identifies both the negative aspects of capital strive to innovate exploitation of working people and the positive aspects of workers' struggles towards freedom in the form of their continued attempts to shorten the working day. Marx's turn from the history of theory to the history of freedom represents for Donievskaya Marxism's potential to make good on its promise to serve as the quote, theoretical expression of the instinctive strivings of the proletariat for liberation. Though it would be another generation before W. E. Du Bois would name the American Civil War a general strike of enslaved workers, 
the Civil War inaugurated a new way of seeing for Marx as the revolutionary 60s emerged from the quiet 1850s. Workers are alive on his pages and on the stage of history. I didn't come across Janievskaya's diagnosis of the centrality of the American Civil War in Marx's writing of Capital until class. However, as I was preparing for class, I did notice of the way between 80 and 1864. Marx describes the capital and workers in these eventful decades, which begin with the Fit Factory Act of 1803, passed in the same year as the act that would gradually abolish slavery in British Tories. Both acts reflected Parliament's delicate consideration for capital, allowed manufacturers to exploit two hours a week and planters to, to exploit slave labor for 45. The legislative drama comes to a climax in 1848 with the implementation of the 10 Hours Act on May 1st. The ruling class consolidated itself, quote, landowners and capitalists, stock exchange sharks and small time shopkeepers, priests and free thinkers, young whores and old nuns came together under the banner of the salvation of property, religion, the family and society. I'm also seeing in the chat that um, is my connection back was it just momentary? It seems to be okay now, sorry. Okay, no problem. Thanks for letting me know. Um, Capital engaged in an open revolt against the act and all the legislation that had come since 1833. He describes this counter-revolution as a pro-slavery rebellion in miniature that lasted years, for which, quote, the rebel capitalist risked nothing but the skin of his own work. As noted in the Penguin edition of Volume 1, Marx often referred to the American Civil War as a pro-slavery rebellion, just as the slave-owning South rebelled to preserve a system of unfreedom that would be abolished only by revolutionary force. The miniature rebellions of Europe would be defeated by the continued struggle of working people through the 1860s. In his journalistic writings on the American Civil War II, Marx registered the war as both inaugurating a novel form of war making and popular struggle. It seems the two always accompany each other. The Civil War in the US represented a new way to wage war, attested to by, quote, the vast extent of the disputed territory, the far flung front of the lines of operation, the numerical strength of the hostile armies, the fabulous costs of these armies the manner of leading them, and the general tactical and strategical principles in accordance with which the war is waged, as Marx wrote for D Press on March 26, 18, 1862. But the war also yielded new forms of revolt. As he remarks at the end of the chapter, the American Civil War released a stagnant American labor movement and allowed for the emergence of the movement of, for the eight-hour day. Similarly, for another commentator, the American or inaugurated experiments in abolition democracy, which included land redistribution, legislation, and autonomous organization among free people. Marx's writing on civil wars, both as metaphor and event, represents then a tradition of seeing war as quickening dialectical movement of history. War not helps. Slide, please. In class, my students are generally uninterested in following Marx's thinking about the American Civil War. Instead, they're concerned by his repeated use of slavery as both metaphor and historical experience to give an account of wage labor in the Victorian factory. They're worried about what his use of slavery as metaphor suggests of his racial politics. Certainly, they insisted, wage labor was not slavery. The response is understandable. After all, the wage form continues to be the mechanism through which we pursue our own subsistence. Admittedly, my first reaction to this kind of response was to be frustrated. It seemed to me that students were not reading closely and were being unfairly influenced by some residual strand of pop Marxism. Like any good Marxist, I'm on the lookout for the use of Marx as a straw man. But there was more to it. Students' hesitations about Marx's turn to slavery to describe the condition of waged factory labor, which would suggest that the battle over the working day is an anti-slavery struggle, also registered another pessimistic historical memory of the Civil War. 
Perhaps it was that the residue of the unfinished transition from bondage to freedom did not seem to reside in the wage form, but in the carceral police state, as 2020, that year of pandemic, death, and rebellion, represented a tragic inheritance of AP, an internal and external forever wars, climate catastrophe, and a resurgent far right lurked in the background. Slide, please. As I try to make sense of students' responses, I turn to Saidiya Hartman's 1997 scenes of selection, in which she refers at one point to the event of emancipation in the United States as a non-event which left free people longing for a freedom that would remain unrealized in the long durée of slavery's afterlives. While the Marx, Denievskaya, Du Bois tradition offers one account of the Civil War, Hartman offers another. She traces the resubordination of freed people after the promises of emancipation were quickly foreclosed after the end of Reconstruction, I should say the defeat of Reconstruction, which she terms the burdened individuality of the rights-bearing subject who was caught in a double bind of freedom. In a riff on Marx, whose worker is both free to sell their labor power, that peculiar commodity, and free all other commodities, Hartman describes the freed person's self-possession as accompanied by the disciplinary forces of indebtedness, regulation, police punishment, quote, free from slavery and free of resources, emancipated and subordinated, self-possessed and indebted, equal and inferior, liberated and encumbered, sovereign and dominated, citizen and subject. Hartman's characterization of emancipation in 1863 as a non-event seems to have launched a thousand ships over the past two and a half decades. Regardless of how it's been taken up, though, Hartman doesn't suggest that emancipation was to of meaning or even uneventful. Rather, her account gives yet another narrative of the American Civil War as a war of tragedy rather than a war of possibility. The American Civil War was then multiple wars. It transformed Marx's philosophy of history, capital, catalyzed experiments in abolition democracy, revolutionized agrarian economies in places like India and Egypt due to the cotton famine, integrating peasant smallholders into debt relations, and necessitated that freed people tread between a travesty emancipation and an illusory freedom. At least four wars in one, its meaning as a war of possibility did not seem to rest in our age of organized movement a new conjuncture that is the legacy of forced reconstruction as it is of neoliberal retrenchment. Slide, please. Someone remarks to me that teaching lies somewhere between performing and preaching. Anne might have resisted the turn to the religious to describe the vocation of teaching, but I find the metaphor to be clarifying. Capital is perhaps a safer text, which is to say a text whose meanings are derived not only from historicization, but also exegesis from an irreverent reading that attempts to retrieve a text received meanings, conjure new ones that might explain the present. Marx is a product of his time, but he also, through exegesis, escapes it. One of four texts, quote, every searcher for truth must know, alongside the Bible, the critique of pure reason, and the species in a 1933 essay crisis. Oh, where did I where did I break up? I'm just seeing the chat. Just about a minute ago. Okay. Um, I'll start with this. Paragraph. Just the boy, just before the Du Bois. Okay. Marx is a product of his time, but he also, through exegesis, escapes it. This is the kind of reading practice Anne taught me. Genealogy shapes the questions we demand of texts, but curiosity supersedes dogma. In a rhyme, religious metaphor, Du Bois included capital as one of four texts every searcher for truth must know, alongside the Bible, the critique of pure reason, and the origin of species in a 1983 essay for the crisis, all books that we may disagree with, but can work. Du Bois published his essay on Marx's relevance to understanding the American color line while teaching his first courses on Marx and Marxism at Atlanta University, a list of grades for one such class displayed on the slide. As Michael Saman notes, 
Du Bois's turn to teaching Marxism in the years in which he was writing his arguably most Marxist text, Black Reconstruction, did not represent a coherent theoretical position on Marxism, but rather reveals Du Bois's own wrestling with how Marxist thought would shape his teaching and thinking. Though Marxian philosophy achieved a, quote, true diagnosis of the situation in Europe in the middle of the 19th century, despite some of its logical difficulties, Du Bois insisted that Marx must be modified as we search for a new truth through that dialectic of historicization and exegesis. Marx saw some things, we see other things. Like it did for Du Bois in 1933, capital seems to reveal a new meaning today. As we moved from the Thirty Years' War of 1914 to 1995 to the Age of Forever Wars. Twenty years on from the U.S. invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq and in the wake of the uprisings of Trump, marks on the world seemed out of joint with the prism that might flow from the present era of imperial war making that seems to defy the norms both of wars of the long 19th century and the cold wars of the short 20th. As sociologist Michael Mann argues, as war has become less in the global north, it in the global south, where a new era of civil war unfolds. Innovations in war technology also allow for an affective displacement of war, which no longer requires the kind of interpersonal combat that once characterized conventional warfare, but instead depends on a long distance callous indifference. If the American Civil War War was a new kind of war, a spectacle without par parallel in the annals of military history, as Marx wrote. Today's literal and metaphorical wars also seem to be unparalleled, even as one does not have to be versed in military history to understand the continuities between the present crisis and the so-called scramble for Africa in advance of the First World War and the tripartite division in the world after the Second World War. This is not to mention the relationship between the reconstruction and the acceleration after the Civil War and the violence that continues to structure the present, perhaps most viscerably discernible in the lethal use of force by those paradigmatic settler colonial actors, vigilantes, sold cops. Official distinctions, I might add, the vigilante who murdered Neely was an evergreen. Something seems different. The instinctive strivings of working people don't seem to be audible to the multisicles. Things are endless. As Michael will discuss, drone operators are the new foot soldiers of capitalist wars. The pandemic drones on. As the late Mike Davis predicted in a 2020 interview, COVID has proven to be a snowballing event that introduced a new historical and geological epic as the efflorescent disease, natural disaster, and precarity the world over sound genocide. The past is in the present and the outside is present in the classroom. The civil war, like the uprising of 2020, continues after lives make even as attempt to assemble their meanings. Next, Michael will prompt us to consider how capitalist war can be under the dialectic of necro labor and necro capital. War and militarism, two words and two lines of thought in the Marxist tradition. On the one hand, a continuing reflection on warfare, warfare as an instrument of state and anti-state forces. On the other hand, an enduring critique of militarism as a pervasive condition of daily life and culture, as um, uh, in the first line of Michael Mann's classic essay, a set of attitudes and social practices which regards war and the preparation for war as a normal and desirable activity. If Marxists have generally been critics of militarism, Rosa Luxemburg stands as perhaps the most eloquent, they have also, from Marx and Engels to Lenin and Mao to Gramsci and Guevara, tended to be orthodox followers of Clausewitz, the great Prussian theorist of war in the age of Napoleon, and particularly his off-cited maxim that war is a continuation of politics with other means. In this part of our presentation, I want to displace the politics of war and war as politics in order to suggest that war and militarism is a continuation of labor with other means. 
What happens if we think of capitalist war as a dialectic of necro labor and necro capital? Is capitalism the fallout of war or is war the fallout of capitalism? My brief remarks have two arguments that war and militarism are constitutive of capitalism as a mode of production, and that capitalist labor relations and work processes are constitutive of modern war and militarism. First, war and militarism are constitutive of capitalism as a mode of production, not only at the micro level of the working day and the workplace, as Damanpreet has just argued, but at the macro level of the working century and the international division of labor. The history of the capitalist mode of production is neither the history of distinct and uneven national capitalisms, advanced or backward, nor the history of a universal world market. Rather, if one recalls Marx's own account, the history of capitalist accumulation manifested itself as a three-century, 300-year commercial war of the European nations, which has the globe as its battlefield, stretching from the 80 years war of the Dutch revolt against Imperial Spain to the 20 years anti-Jacobin war to the 20 years opium wars launched against Qing China. Those are Marx's examples. These wars were not simply examples of enduring ethnic enmities, a human propensity to conquest. They were the product of capitalism's systematic combination that embraces, Marx wrote, four key elements, elements as central to the logic of accumulation as wage labor and the mathematics of value itself, the colonies, the national debt, the modern tax system, and the system of protection. These elements, particularly the colonial system, depend in part on brute force, Marx wrote, but all employ the power of the state, the concentrated and organized force of society as a hothouse of transformation. Force, Marx concludes, is itself an economic power. Against all the theories of commerce and the world market as harbingers of perpetual priests, Marx insists that capitalism is unending war, sometimes hidden, sometimes open. These cycles of commercial war were often triggered by struggles over the colonial system, and all modern cycles of capitalist world war also began from the colonial system. The 60 years imperial war of 1755 to 1815 that culminated in the Napoleonic Wars that found enduring textualization in Clausewitz's On War and Tolstoy's War and Peace had their roots in colonial conquests in India, in the North American French and Indian Wars, and in the slave wars of the Caribbean from Tacky's Revolt to the Haitian Revolution. It was in these colonial wars that the first theorists of irregular war emerged, petty guerre, or in the better known term that emerged in the wake of the Iberian resistance to Napoleon, guerrilla war. Similarly, the 90 years war of large scale industry that stretched from the industrialization of war in the Crimea and in the North American Civil War to the global wars we have come to call World War I and World War II, not only accelerated the end of labor regimes of serfdom and slavery, but intensified the violent displacement of native peoples across the Eurasian steppe, the wars against the Tartar peoples depicted in Tolstoy's late Haji Murat, and the North American Plains, the wars inaugurated by the Sand Creek Massacre of 1863. The late 19th century appearance of a long peace was actually the combination of European standstill and colonial invasion, late Victorian holocausts, as Mike Davis once put it, and was marked by the turn of the century invention of the concentration camp, in the Boer War, the Cuban War, the Philippine War, and the German War against the Herero people of Southwest Africa. 
It's only a matter of time before the war in the colonies becomes the European war, the young Gramsci wrote. And across the Atlantic, Du Bois recognized what he called the African roots of the Great War. Two decades later, Mao discerned the colonial roots of what would be named the Second World War, writing in 1938 of the sources of, quote, protracted war in the Italian invasion of Ethiopia, in the attack on the Spanish Republic by the colonial officers in Spanish Morocco, and in the Chinese War of Resistance against the Japanese invasion. The bombing of a military base in a U.S. colony, Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, extended the front and cycle of the conflict. And we might, though it's probably too soon to say, see the postmodern, post-nuclear, forever or endless war of the last 75 years with its global archipelago of bases and test sites as having its roots in the still unended war on the Korean Peninsula, which Madeline will address next week in the dirty wars and counter-revolutions across Latin America following the coup in Guatemala, which Javier will address next week, and in the decades of nuclear testing across Pacific islands and atolls that Anshul will address, and in the wars across West and Central Asia after the Nakba and the coup in Iran that Monique will address. But if war is constitutive, of the capitalist world system, capitalist labor regimes are constitutive of war and militarism. If one thinks of war and militarism, not from the point of view of states and state actors, the geopolitical eye of most media, social and otherwise, but from the point of view of ordinary life, war and militarism emerge as forms of labor. As Oscar Necht and Alexander Kluge put it in their great history and obstinacy, all the small steps of war are acts of concrete labor. War is actually composed of a special form of labor that we must investigate if its monstrosity is to be opposed. War and war preparation are labor processes in an industry alongside others, particularly those curious public-private industries like healthcare and higher education. Soldiering or military labor is one kind of necropolitical labor, Jin Kung Lee argues, a job that can be carried out only by necessarily risking one's life. Consider the social forms and material content of military labor. On the one hand, military labor appears in a host of social forms of exploitation, the labor relations that are analyzed in the excellent international anthology, Fighting for a Living. Is military labor waged or conscripted? Is it directly employed by the state? or is it subcontracted to various forms of mercenaries and security forms? Soldiers, Charles Tilley reminded us, were the first mass wage laborers, and much of the historiography of modern war is dominated by the shift from the mercenary soldiering in the era before the Treaty of Westphalia to the vast citizen conscript armies of the century after the French Revolution. We are only now registering the remarkable reversal in the neoliberal shift in the U.S. and elsewhere as the conscript army, the mass army of World War II, which through the GI Bill generated the post-war mass university, is transformed into a volunteer army of employees with careers, salaries, and benefits. Nixon's radical shift to the volunteer army was on the one hand, a response to the mass resistance to the draft and conscription during the invasion of Vietnam. But it was also advocated by the pioneering neoliberal economists who drove the privatization and marketization of military costs, a story well told by Beth Bailey. As a result, more and more military labor has been subcontracted to private firms, 
from Eric Prince's Blackwater to Evgeny Prigozhin's Wagner Group. Moreover, like the privatized industries of health and higher education, militaries have come to depend on the recruitment and maintenance of racially and ethnically stratified workforces, segmented between migrant workers, occupied locals, and military personnel and families. If we turn from the valorization process to the labor process, from the social form to the material content, we see equally far-reaching shifts that parallel the arc from manufacture to large-scale industry to the service economy. The moment of manufacture with its skilled craft workers and its laboring hands handling the spade and routine drills where the soldier's daily occupation, McNeil argued in his classic account of the early modern military revolution, is manifested in the classic division between the skilled labor of long-distance sharpshooters and mounted cavalry that we see in, in Tolstoy and in Engels, the artisanal metal trades of the field artillery and the naval guns, depending on an emerging industrial production of munitions and shells, and the infantry's hand-to-hand -hand construction and destruction. These labor processes were superseded, massacred, one might say, by the large-scale industry of the second military industrial revolution, with its machine guns, poison gases, motorized transport trucks, tanks, steamships, airplanes. Thus, the often narrated shift from industrial to service occupations has its military analog as well, as service labor has grown as a proportion of military labor, from logistics, transport, and maintenance to sex work and medical care. As Sam Moyne notes, the U.S. trains more drone operators on screens than pilots in cockpits. Of course, much military work was always service work, not least the work of watching, guards, pickets, patrols. Nevertheless, with the automation of military technology, particularly with the aerial drones of surveillance and attack, and the expansion of bases as entire extraterritorial communities. Well, going back one there, sorry. Uh, David Vine notes that U.S. military families became part of the base population from 1960. In that period, the armed services have become a service industry, even in rhetoric where thank you for your service as a greeting to military workers is now a commonplace of public life in the United States. But if this picture draws on the ordinary notion of the service economy, Jun Kung Lee's powerful rethinking of all labor as service labor places soldiers and sex workers at the center of modern work. Military work, she writes, is the ultimate service labor, since it literally erases one in the act of performing the labor. A military worker works and dies as a surrogate. If necrolabor is constitutive of capitalism as a mode of production and destruction, it may also mark a fundamental limit of capitalist accumulation. In the obstinacy of labor power, forces may well reside that are spontaneously effective against war, Necton Klug argued. Nothing else will help. If war is about the destruction of the will, that is, of the autonomy of the other, then peace is also a production process, the construction of the autonomy or of the will of the other. Perhaps the mass resistance to war might also be seen as a fallout of war. And now Jesse will take us to the fallout of the Second World War in the rhymes and off rhymes of African-American poetry. Thank you, Michael. In this portion of our presentation, I want to make the case for poetic strategies of historicizing war and its fallout by turning to African-American poetry, starting with Gwendolyn Brooks, the first African-American writer to win the Pulitzer Prize. 
In an interview about her early writing, Brooks makes a revelatory declaration. She discusses a sonnet sequence published at the end of World War II entitled Gay Chaps at the Bar. Slide, please. That was inspired by letters Brooks received from African Americans fighting abroad, or more precisely, inspired by their ambivalent allegiances to the nation for which they were fighting that also condoned Jim Crow's regime of racial terror. Brooks describes her process as an attempt to render this ambivalence by altering the traditionally neat and predictable rhyme scheme of an English sonnet. She says, a sonnet series in off rhyme because I felt it was an off rhyme situation. I first wrote the one sonnet because of a letter I got from a soldier who included that title. And then I said, there are other things to say about what's going on at the front. And I'll write more poems based on the stuff of letters that I was getting from several soldiers. And I felt it would be good to have them all in the same form." End quote. At this moment in 1945, many demands were being made of black men's allegiances by their military unit in the international fight abroad that bred a coincided nationalism, especially with Cold War antagonisms of East versus West, and by their black communities who labored in segregated workplaces like the military and were subject to the disenfranchisement and codified racial apartheid. This portion of our presentation, I want to examine how Brooks understands her poetry and poetic form in particular as telegraphing the dialectic between race and nation that World War II and the Cold War heralded and crystallized. Slide, please. Let us turn to a poem entitled The Progress, the final poem in the 12 poem sonnet sequence, which is also the final poem in Brooks's 1945 book, A Street in Bronzeville. The poem goes, and still we wear our uniforms, follow the cracked cry of the bugles, comb and brush our pride and prejudice, doctor the sallow, initial ardor, wish to keep it fresh. Still we applaud the president's voice and face. Still we remark on patriotism, sing, salute the flag, thrill heavily, rejoice, for death of men who saluted too, sang, but inward grows a soberness and awe, a fear, a deepening hollow through the cold. For even if we come out standing up, how shall we smile, congratulate, and how settle in chairs? Listen, listen, the step of iron feet again and again, wild. To say more, allow me to briefly digress into the intricacies of poetic rhyme, and I promise there is a payoff. So rhyme is largely understood to be the chiming of similar sounds in a predictable pattern. Thus, the words of a rhyme are a curious harmony of the sensory and the logical, and a rest of the logical and sensory form. They are an icon in which an idea is multiply signified. Of course, the definition of what counts as rhyme is conventional and cultural. It changes from one nation, language, era, and verse tradition to another. Regardless of its specific context, rhyme augments the hermeneutic process by staging a sonic juxtaposition that is semantic figure for comparison, contrast, or both. A perfect rhyme occurs when the exact sound, the same consonants and the same vowels, repeat as the last syllable of poetic lines that are close enough to be heard as repetition. The combination of sound and position sets up an expectation of future likeness. The reader listens for and often yearns for the same sound in the same place. That expectation and desire can either be fulfilled or denied. Or in the case of off rhyme, both or neither. Off rhyme delivers yet always defers. We hear Brooks's off rhyme and how her lines conclude with both a repetition of consonants and a slight difference of vowels. Slide please. The first and third lines conclude, respectively, with the off-rhyming words follow and sallow. The former has a short O, as in follow, and the latter has a long A, as in sallow, forming a subtle yet significant sonic mismatch as the lines conclude. Slide, please. These consonant rhymes continue throughout the poem. Words like sing in line six and sang in line eight share consonants but not vowels and ah in line nine and how in line 12 share only consonant sounds. In the final couplet, where traditionally everything is rhetorically cinched together with a rhyming couplet, but where in Brooks's poems, poem the first word of step and wild 
right don't they barely rhyme at all the hard stop endings of p and d only manage to whisper a rhyme when a poet writes in a form like a sonnet whose tr historical tradition creates the expectation of perfect rhyme an off rhyme creates a sonic disjuncture in which the analogous relation is metonymic it implies a nevertheless in the semantic field of meaning for gwendolyn brooks in the wake of world war ii consonant off rhyme is metonymic of a vertiginous discordance within the post-war excuse me atomic age and slowly decolonizing world in which Black Americans had fought for democratic self-determination abroad without the provision of it at home. In Brooks's hands and in her reader's ears, off rhyme becomes a site of ideological frustration. Brooks's sonnet, The Progress, dramatizes this tension as the soldiers still, still wear their uniforms and sing rituals of nationalism, but, quote, a fear, a deepening hollow through the cold. A Black veteran haunted by a violent past fears its return in a, more put in a putatively more free present. In this moment, when the promises of U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt's Four Freedoms and Atlantic Charter were allegedly fulfilled, and American universalism allegedly proved triumphant, Brooks rearticulates in negative terms what Euro-American romantic thinkers call the spirit of the age. Liberal America saw itself as leading the world in the realization of a universal freedom and the completion of a progressive history. For Brooks, however, this Black veteran's temporal unmooring and war-formed subjectivity indexes what Cedric Robertson calls this age's, quote, conflicting constructions of civilization and the ordering mechanism of race, end quote. Brooks's poem dilates in the uncertainty of how these structuring contradictions will continue in the coming decades as global decolonization attempts to deconstruct racial hierarchies and reconstruct the nation form. Let's not forget that in 1945, anti-colonialism was active, but decolonization was by no means certain. Independence was still a few years away for nations in Asia and about a decade away for those in Africa. So to return to this final couplet, Brooks's barely existent off rhyme prompts questions about the linguistic patterning of self-determination. The iron feet are a metonym of both enslavement and marching soldiers. They're also a homonym for the smallest syllabic units of English prosody. This sonic figure creates a contiguity between literary tradition and subjugation, wondering if these veterans will become foot soldiers for imperial systems of global rule whose hegemony has now been arrogated to American politics and culture. Is the ever repeating, quote, step of iron feet again and again wild, traversing the arc of teleologically inevitable progress, or does its off rhyme sound out a more cyclical or more wild form of history? In other words, will mid-century Black movements for self-determination inscribe a perfect rhyme between the imperial racial order before and after World War II? Or will this era of hot and cold war create the conditions of possibility to break with Western tradition and articulate a shift in the revolutionary democratic idiolect? Such poetic messianism rhymes with another time in the U.S.'s history of Black poetry and political transformation. Slide, please. As literary historian Matt Sandler has argued, in the mid-19th century before and after the Civil War, an independent and distinct kind of romantic prophetic vision and revolutionary freedom dream took place or took shape among Black writers of the U.S. abolition movement and radical reconstruction. Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, for example, in her antebellum poem to the Union Savers of Cleveland, excoriates Ohioans for accepting the Fugitive Slave Act. She notes how even white Northerners by their submission to Southern planters, quote, barter manly honor for the union and for gold, end quote. Taking their politically expedient moral weakness as the occasion for prophecy, Harper warns her audience of the coming storm. Figures of the thunderbolts and whirlwind recall Ezekiel's Old Testament vision of Jerusalem's destruction. In her apocalyptic vision, Harper, like Brooks, indicts the entire project of American democracy, underscoring their mutual visions of freedom that remain unfulfilled today. Slide, please. <laughs> 
The post-Reconstruction era poet Albury Olson Whitman writes epics about Black and Native people that argue against settler colonial theories of progress. In Idol of the South, he rewrites American frontier history to begin with slavery and dispossession and concludes, as we see here, with a vexed dream of the, quote, new world greatness, end quote, he wants the U.S. to become. It is no coincidence that the final couplet contains an off rhyme between populace and race sounding out the inarticulability of a multiracial paradise in this historical moment, while also hinting its possibility in the future. Slide, please. At its most acute, 19th century romantic poetry frames the day's events in terms of vast historical and geographic struggle, or excuse me, geopolitical struggle, in which Black poets attempted to reject, as Domin Preet has laid out for us, what Du Bois in Black Reconstruction calls compensated democracy, which defines citizenship by ability to work for wealth, enabling post-war reconciliation between Northern industrialists and Southern landowners. Black Romantic poetry instead envisions Du Bois's alternative ab abolition democracy, a post-slavery society that offers each member the, quote, economic, political, and social, social capital to live as equal members, end quote. In the middle decades of the 20th century, a new version of this vision took shape among the Black writers of the civil rights era, or the so-called Second Reconstruction. If, as my colleagues today and next week so insightfully explain, Theorists like Marx, Balibar, and Gramsci cast war as a constant condition by which we periodize history. Then Brooks transformed the romantic vision of Civil War era Black poetry in an effort to bring about the end of Jim Crow and the generation of global Black solidarities, marking the historical conjuncture of Black poetics as a self-determining epistemology in the decolonizing world order. Brooks understood the years during the waning of World War II and the waxing of the Cold War as a recapitulation, yes, renovation of romantic revolution in the history of Black freedom struggles. And Brooks imagined her generation's freedom struggles as an iron step with those of the mid 19th century in an ongoing total cultural and political transformation that is yet unrealized. Poetic off rhyme provides a form for seeing liberatory expectation deferred again and again. It renders ideological frustration across a long durée. In the mid 20th century, this, torse, this discourse resounded within black and leftist realms with writers like Richard Wright, Ralph Ellison and CLR James driving the conversation. Their concerns ran counter to widely circulated visions of American universalism that informed the U.S.'s post-war international relations, in which the U.S. conceived of itself as, in the words of media magnate Henry Luce, quote, the most powerful and vital nation in the world that should thus, quote, exert the final impact, the full impact of influence, however it sees fit, end quote. Slide, please. But it is not revelatory to point out that the state's projections did not align with conceptions of freedom circulating in the Black public sphere. This field of periodicals and novels has been thoroughly established, and this slide shows a few examples. But even though Brooks's 1945 sonnet sequence demonstrates poetry's participation in this tradition, poetic techniques remain under discussed as strategies for envisioning the post-war world order. In this Protean period, Brooks's poetry and the poetry of her peers troubled the grammar of liberal nationalism, appealing for forms of self-determination that looked beyond the nation, full citizenship, and individual rights alone. But that is not to say, however, that Brooks and her generation reject these traditional forms of self-determination altogether. Rather, they deploy the affordances of poetic strategies in order to, as cultural historian Nikhil Paul Singh puts it, quote, reinvest them with the power of their own struggles, end quote. Five years after Brooks' sonnet sequence, poet Margaret Walker also recognized the coincidence of poetic form and racial freedom struggles. Slide, please. In 1950, Filan Magazine, a Black periodical established and edited by Du Bois, assembled a forum of major Black writers to reflect on the state of the literary field at mid-century. Margaret Walker's piece, entitled New Poets, delineates the main concerns of Black poetry, signaling the potentialities of poetic form and apocalyptic vision. 
She names Gwendolyn Brooks, Owen Dodson, and Melvin Tolson, as well as herself, as poets whose books are particularly concerned with the threat of global war and its ushering of the world into the atomic age. In the face of Western culture's potential annihilation, quote, whether by atomic or hydrogen bomb, or the tremendous wave of social revolution sweeping through the world, end quote, Walker connects the fate of Black poetry to the fate of the world. She asks if, during this cataclysmic era, Black poets who write in traditional Western forms are, quote, doomed to annihilation because they are part of a doomed Western world, or is that Western culture really doomed? End quote. That is, she articulates a knot that Black poetics and poets attempted to untangle throughout the mid-century. How do modes of self-determination in the U.S. transform along a transforming geopolitics? And how can Black poetry be a conduit for these transformations? If the fate of Black Americans is tied up with the fate of the West, is employing traditional poetic forms actually the mark of regression, or is it an attempt to redeem forms of Western culture, including poetic forms, in order to ensure their own survival? Slide, please. To address these questions, let us return to Brooks's sonnets, to the one she wrote first and that sparked the rest of the sequence. She takes the title, Gay Chaps at the Bar, from a letter written to her by Lieutenant William Couch, as quoted in the poem's epigraph. All across the U.S., Black veterans are returning from fighting in places like the South Pacific, whose fallout Anshul and Madeline will explore next week. In the poem, which of course is in off rhyme, language itself is the problem. The veterans at the bar still, quote, knew how to order, end quote, but they're unsure how to make their racialized experiences legible. They, quote, knew white speech, unquote, but they have no, quote, smart athletic language, end quote, for their estrangement within the racially segregated nation they've labored for and served. While casual chat is isolating and insufficient, poetry just might provide a cultural form for situating these gay chaps within a collective history of Black liberation. Brooks's wild sonics and semantics demonstrate how war, like history, never repeats itself but it does off rhyme. And now I'll turn things over to Lucero for how war and memory inform and transform each other. Thank you. I want to start off by focusing our attention to this drawing by Japanese American artist, Elise Imoto. The juxtaposition of a child in black and white and the other in color marks the past and present. One child is painted in black and white and resembles a young Japanese American girl. The second child pictured on the right is depicted in color and resembles a young Mexican or Central American child. The background includes a watchtower and buildings that were typically found in incarceration camps in the US during the Second World War and a US port of entry sign with figures that resemble armed border patrol agents. This image represents a convergence of past and present forms of incarceration and policing, and it illustrates the similarities of the experiences of Japanese American, Mexican, Central American, and other migrant children at the border. Slide, please. Migrant detention has been on the rise since 2016, and as of August 2022, there had been 372 cases of family separation since the start of the Biden administration. Political rhetoric and policies in the U.S. and Mexico have contributed to the criminalization of Central American migrants who, escaping violence from their home countries, continue to face violence while they travel north to the U.S.-Mexico border. Most of these families are forced to wait in Mexican border towns and are also forced to attempt to cross the border as they face long wait times for their asylum cases. Migrants who try to cross the border and are detained are subjected to inhumane treatment, and this was evident in the Trump administration's zero-tolerance policy. In May 2018, Attorney General Jeff Sessions announced the start of the US's, US, United States zero-tolerance policy, which was meant to function as a deterrent uh, by criminally convicting all migrants and separating any parents or children crossing with adults. This also increased the number of unaccompanied migrant children and children in shelter, shelter sorry, as parents would have um, them cross on their own to seek asylum. 
Here's a graph from the Texas Tribune article that notes that over 1,000 children were placed in across 35 camps in Texas in September 2019. The fact that migrants would be criminally convicted would further mark them as threats and, quote, criminals, words used to describe them before they even enter the country. Slide, please. Like Central American, Haitian, Venezuelan, and other migrants at the border today, Japanese migrants living in the U.S. and Mexican states along the U.S.-Mexico border were marked as threats to both countries during World War II, yet these stories are not widely known. Today, I will talk about the criminalization of Japanese communities, an incarceration camp in South Texas, and the story of family separation during the war. Many of these stories of forced removal live in the present within the memories of these families and the stories they share, but not in the national narratives that attempt to erase the ways their wartime policies affected families during the war. Today, Japanese Americans and Japanese Mexicans are sharing these stories in an attempt to stop repeating history. Slide, please. On January 1942, uh, Mexican President Manuel Avila Camacho ordered all Japanese migrants and Japanese Mexicans uh, communities living near the Pacific coast and the U.S.-Mexico border to relocate to central Mexico. The Mexican government gave Japanese Mexicans 24 hours to evacuate and move to the cities of Guadalajara and Mexico City in central Mexico. The government's response targeted Japanese communities near the border and the Pacific coast because of their proximity to the U.S. and to Japan. Slide, please. Similarly, on February 19, 1942, President FDR passed Executive Order 9066 that called for the relocation and incarceration of Japanese Americans and all other individuals of Japanese descent. Many of these Japanese were citizens, but regardless, they were forced to move from the West Coast to camps across the West. Flyer, like, flyers like this one, pictured here, were posted across the West Coast to announce the forced removal and incarceration of these Japanese communities. The U.S. government used the language of national emergency and military necessity to convey that Japanese incarceration was necessary to protect U.S. citizens and that there was a possibility that the Japanese empire and Japanese Americans could collaborate. Despite the liberal politicians and government officials who believe the camps would help Japanese Americans assimilate, Japanese Americans became rightless subjects within these camps. Slide, please. Historian Sergio Hernandez Galindo argues that the creation of an enemy of the state is part of an ideological war that becomes just as significant as wars between militaries. In this case, the ideological war created in the U.S.-Mexico borderlands was a war against the Japanese, evident in the title of his book, La Guerra contra los Japoneses en México, The War Against the Japanese in Mexico. He does not only focus on Mexico, but also discusses the role the U.S. government played in the creation of this ideological war. This war on the home front was marked by various moments prior to the start of the war, such as the Japanese victory against Russia in 1905, the 1924 Immigration Act in the U.S. that stopped all Asian labor migration, and the rapid growth of Japanese empire in the early 1930s. These historical events are part of the, of the growth of hemispheric anti-Japanese sentiment that existed with varying prominence in countries across North America and Latin America, and that was exacerbated by the attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941. Hernandez Galindo and scholars of Japanese incarceration across the Americas have focused on how the forced relocation and incarceration of the Japanese illustrates the unconstitutionality of their displacement and these decisions um, and how these decisions were made without a legal process. The US, Mexico, and other countries across the Americas stripped Japanese nationals, many of whom were already naturalized citizens, of their rights and treated them as enemies of the state. Slide, please. After the relocation orders in Mexico and the US, Japanese Americans and Japanese Latin Americans were incarcerated in camps across the U.S. 
One of these camps was located about 50 miles north of the Texas-Mexico border. The Crystal City Camp opened in 1942, and it was used to hold Japanese Americans, Japanese Latin Americans, as well as other internees of Italian and German descent. Slide, please. This camp was operated by the Border Patrol and Immigration and Naturalization um, Service agents, but this history of Japanese incarceration is not often remembered um, within the history of criminalization and exclusion in South Texas and the U.S.-Mexico border region. The presence of this Japanese incarceration camp in South Texas is also not part of the region's memory. In both of these cases, um, the law becomes the mechanism of uh, racial exclusion and exclusion, uh, sorry, racial formation and exclusion at the border. Um, they also show how the U.S. government and its law enforcement agencies have utilized the border as a tool of state formation through surveillance and policing of, quote, criminal and, quote, suspect classes. Slide, please. Since 2006, a historical marker and a monument for the Crystal City Family Camp can be found near the old property where the camp was located. Although this exists, the history of Japanese incarceration is often seen as distant from South Texas and not related to larger histories of incarceration in the region. These two moments um, in uh, South Texas history are part of the larger normalization of violence that is deemed acceptable by the state through its language and its policies. Slide, please. In the case of Mexico, Japanese Mexican memories of World War II are often obscured and not shared by Japanese who suffered um, discrimination and racism and who had to forcibly leave their homes during this period. Mexico is often seen as a benevolent state in discussions about Japanese incarceration during the war. And this continues to be, uh, this continues in the present um, as discussions of migrants and refugees at the border um, exclude Mexico um, as a culprit. The Mexican government reaches agreements with the US about these policies at the border um, and local authorities in these border states continue to leave migrants without protection as um, evident in the fire um, in the migrant center that killed 40 migrants last March in Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua, in Mexico. The stories of Japanese criminalization, incarceration, and forced removal during the war are also not acknowledged by, Mexican, uh, by the Mexican government, and the experiences of Japanese Mexicans um, get lost in national histories of post-revolutionary Mexico. While some families are able to openly talk about what happened during the war in Mexico, Others only carried, uh, carry fragmented living memories. Families share these living memories with each other during the holidays, at family gathering, or over meals. Slide, please. When I visited Rosy Galvania Manaca's home in Piedras Negras, Coahuila, she had a meal prepared for me. I sat down in her dining room, and they listened um, as she told me stories of her grandfather, Jose Angel Yamanaka who migrated to Mexico at the start of the 20th century. Galvania Manaca began telling me how her grandfather had relocated to Moncloa, Coahuila, um, just a few miles south of Piedras Negras, after she recalled how she had a few photographs in her family album. She is aware that her grandfather was forced to leave Piedras Negras and relocate to Moncloa during the war because she was born in 1941, right at the start of the war. She carries these stories um, and shares them with her family because she spent time with her grandfather, uncles, aunts um, that lived during the war and has photographs and anecdotes to remember the wartime years. Other Mexican Nike families do not know what happened to their family members during the war or it, or it, um, it takes them years to find out why family members um, had to re relocate to parts of central Mexico. Fragments of Japanese Mexican stories and memories are stored in the Mexican National Archive um, in Mexico City, alongside thousands of folders documenting the forced relocation and surveillance of Japanese families during the war. Mexican intelligence agencies, along with the FBI, the Border Patrol, the INS, and local law enforcement in Texan and Mexican border towns, were part of the relocation and removal of Japanese nationals and Japanese families from the U.S.-Mexico border region. However, the stories of Japanese Americans and Japanese Mexicans are often not told together 
obscuring the ways Japanese, uh, sorry, obscuring the way um, both the Mexican and American governments were complicit in the racialization and criminalization of Japanese communities during the war. Slide, please. Today in Mexico, there have been efforts to educate the public on the discrimination faced by Japanese families during the war, and even an effort to, an obtain, to obtain an apology from the Mexican government. Junko Ogata Aguilar, fourth generation Nike and Afro-Mexicana, began a petition to get the Mexican government to apologize for its treatment of Nike communities in Mexico during World War II. She worked for three years to circulate a petition among Japanese communities in Mexico, and she was interviewed by um, various Mexican media outlets, such as um, AJ Plus um, in Espanol, to get her efforts out to the public. There were mixed reactions to her efforts within the Japanese community, especially from older Japanese Mexicans who were upset by her petition. With the pandemic and other things going on in Ogata Aguilar's life, um, her efforts fell through, but she still believes um, this violence um, that Japanese experienced during the war is part of Mexican national history um, that is not known in, or remembered in a Mexican collective memory or taught in schools. Ogata Aguilar wants the history to be recognized publicly in Mexico. Slide, please. In the U.S., groups like Sudo for Solidarity are trying to change this. The project is made up of Japanese American social justice advocates that lead campaigns across the U.S. to educate the public on uh, the history of Japanese incarceration and build solidarities with other groups that are targeted by racist immigration policies. Some of the groups, pro um, some of the project's members are Japanese Americans that were incarcerated with their families during the war or are descendants of these families. They lead campaigns outside of migrant detention centers in Texas, Oklahoma, Philadelphia, and other states to protest the conditions of these centers and family separation. These advocates use their own experiences and the stories of family separation during World War II to, quote, stop repeating history, a big um, motto that they use throughout all their campaigns. Japanese incarceration near the U.S.-Mexico border and the current state policies um, that developed as a result of racialized immigration um, and policies of the 20th century um, are part of this history and groups uh, for Student for Solidarity are highlighting this history and advocating against the continuation of these, uh, these moments. Descendants of these Japanese families and the, in the U.S. and Mexico and community organizations are making sure these histories are not forgotten. The history of Japanese incarceration, forced removal, and family separation during the war on both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border illustrate the legacies of violence that have longer ties to anti-Asian exclusion in the late 19th century that continue into the present with the criminalization and incarceration of migrants and asylum seekers at the U.S.-Mexico border. Thank you. And now we move to Monique's discussion on American sitcoms and the global war on terror, um, as she describes both as war comedies of liberalism. Thank you, Lucero. Um, slide, please. Thank you. 20 years ago this past March marks the U.S. invasion of Iraq a conjuncture that inaugurated a new era of imperial violence and also served as a continuation in a long imperial tradition. Slide. People across the Anglophone world marked the anniversary of the invasion on social media, creating a digital archive of the horrors of US imperial justifications, such as the video screen grabbed here of political commentator and mouthpiece for empire, Thomas Friedman stating that, quote, we hit Iraq because we could. Slide. Another Twitter user, a former U.S. military member, wrote this tweet with an eye towards those who have no living memory of the early years of the global war on terror. As he writes, quote, for those too young to understand what a fucked up time in America this was, people threw parties to watch shock and awe strikes like it was a sporting event. To adopt the language of this tweet, that fucked up time in America was on display in every corner of U.S. culture, politics, and society. Slide, please including in the world of supposedly lighthearted situation comedies as represented by the NBC show 30 Rock. 
This episode, airing four years after the initial invasion of Iraq and nearly six years after the beginning of the U.S. war in Afghanistan, demonstrated to audiences the limits of liberal critiques of neoconservative war making. Good liberal Americans could and should critique President George W. Bush and the ongoing war in Iraq, but they certainly could not state that they hated the troops. The episode that this scene comes from was a reminder to an assumed U.S. liberal audience of what was acceptable for them to say and do during wartime. But we might ask ourselves what exactly this scene and the episode as a whole were doing in a satirical TV show about a regular white woman working at NBC on a Saturday Night Live style sketch comedy show. If we put the initial tweets I began with in conversation with this scene from 30 Rock, a show that we may, slide please, perhaps be most familiar with from the many memes it has generated, such as this one, we can begin to see the traces of what sociologist Michael Mann terms spectator sport militarism. Mann writes that spectator sport militarism is how nations within the so-called Western world are mobilized not as players, but as spectators to militarist violence. While I find Mann's theorization of spectator sport militarism useful, I want to complicate his theorization a bit. Slide, please especially by drawing on the work of various interdisciplinary scholars whose texts I've highlighted here. Writing during the Reagan years in 1987, Mann claimed that, quote, contemporary militarism is not upfront. It is subtle and diverse, with militarism no longer being central to the social structure of the West, end quote. I want to push against this idea that contemporary militarism is no longer upfront and is no longer central to Western social structures, especially within the context of the global war on terror and how the quotidian texture of militarism manifests during the forever wars in the United States. And I want to do so by asking us to consider an admittedly unconventional set of cultural texts when considering the global war on terror, U.S. sitcoms from the 2000s and early 2010s. Now, I recognize that these are perhaps the wrong type of cultural text to look at when considering the cultural narratives and scripts that dominated U.S. media during the years following 9-11. Slide, please. Overtly Orientalist TV shows such as 24 or Homeland and films such as Zero Dark Thirty are, for example, explicitly about the global war on terror and much can and has been said about them. But I want us to turn our collective attention away from the world of realist political depictions of terrorism, imperial violence, and the U.S. military, and instead focus in on the ostensibly non-militaristic world of comedy and the situation comedy, or sitcom specifically. Slide, please. I focus on sitcoms that aired roughly between 2003 and 2013, such as Arrested Development, The Office, and 30 Rock all of which are understood to operate within a liberal, even progressive form of comedy that understands itself as providing salient critiques of right-wing and neoconservative politics in the U.S. I want to argue here today that it is within the humorous world of situation comedies, and specifically sitcoms structured by liberal understandings of humor and political critique, that we can really see the power of imperialistic and militaristic narratives in the United States. The comedic is not trivial, it matters in our understanding of the world, and in the case of the global war on terror, I argue that there is a specific relationship between liberalism and humor. These cultural productions, though understanding themselves as critical of U.S. war making, ultimately do not transcend American desires for military, imperial, and cultural hegemony across the world. Focusing on the comedic allows for us to understand the everydayness of the global war on terror as lived in the heart of empire. Comedy structures our understanding of the world differently than drama or romance. And in the case of workplace comedies like 30 Rock or The Office, they exemplify a very particular understanding, not only of the neoliberal workplace, but of everyday militarism and U.S. empire. Specifically, I want to draw our attention to the political work that comedy is doing within the context of the global war on terror and how liberals within the United States utilized the comedic as a simultaneous attempt at non-confrontational critique 
while advocating for a very particular type of U.S. war making in relation to Bush era violence in Iraq. This relationship between liberalism and humor during the global war on terror was expressed not just through race regarding depictions of the terrorist or white claims to innocence, but specifically through abject racial and sexual fantasies and perversion. My focus on the situation comedy is here inspired by the work of several scholars who have demonstrated the importance of focusing our attention on the supposedly trivial or playful. As Jasbir Poir has written, quote, the trivial must be attended to precisely because marking it as such may mask its deeper cultural relevance, end quote. Paying attention to comedy, to what is supposed to make us laugh, to who we are meant to be laughing with, as opposed to laughing at, allows for us to both understand what the lines are that we can cross and who counts in the collective us. These situation comedies prop up ideas about who can laugh, about what exactly the ha-ha is, and how comedy functions within the context of historic imperial violence. The situation comedies I've chosen to focus on are hyper-referential, and depend on the viewer being familiar with diverse cultural, political, and ideological texts, including the infamous photographs of torture at Abu Ghraib, or the existence of the enemy combatant as a legal category. But I should be clear here that while these sitcoms were and continue to be popular, in that many, many people across the world watch them, they're representative not of how Stuart Hall articulates the popular, but instead in what he has termed the culture of the power block, who in his words, are the side with the cultural power to decide what belongs and what does not. Slide please. In an episode of Arrested Development that I've put up on the screen here, the character on the right, Buster Bluth, the enlisted son of a wealthy California real estate tycoon, poses excitedly with the Saddam Hussein lookalike he and his brothers have inadvertently come across while in Iraq. The episode aired in 2005 with the three adult Bluth brothers flying to Iraq as part of a complicated subplot regarding their father illegally building homes there. Slide, please. The episode is ostensibly a critique of the US invasion of Iraq and the global war on terror, as is much of the original series run. References to President George W. Bush, to enemy combatants, to Halliburton, to Vice President Dick Cheney, litter even just this short scene that includes depictions of US soldiers training Iraqi soldiers on not only how to run a prison, but on how to hurt incarcerated people without leaving a bruise. Now, in some ways, this episode does stand as an important critique of US military, political, and capitalist violence in Iraq. And yet the episode is incredibly racist, with white characters choking on a moth in such a way as to supposedly sound to non-Arabic speakers, like they are speaking Arabic, for example. What exactly the joke is meant to be here and at whose expense is therefore muddied by liberal racism. Originally airing from 2003 to 2006 on Fox, Arrested Development has long been hailed in the United States as a groundbreaking TV show, launching an era of mockumentary style comedies, including the popular US version of The Office that aired on NBC from 2005 to 2013. Slide please. While The Office less overtly attempts to provide liberal critiques of empire compared to Arrested Development, it nonetheless repeatedly returns to the global war on terror in small, seemingly inconsequential ways throughout its series run. In the episode seen on screen here, the episode's title plays off of the critical issue of surveillance during the global war on terror, albeit couched within a pathetic attempt by the office manager, Michael Scott, seen here, to survey his employees and in the process discovering that he has not been invited to a party. The episode begins as manager Michael sees a brown man wearing a turban in the parking lot and he freaks out running around the office, telling the employees to lock the doors because a terrorist is at the door. The terrorist turns out to simply be the company's South Asian tech employee, Sadiq, who Michael has hired to help install the desired email surveillance. Assumedly, Michael's inept and ironic racism is meant to be the laugh here, but it's difficult to locate humor in a moment representative of the violence enacted against men in turbans in the United States due to the global war on terror. 
including, for example, the murder of Balbir Singh Sodhi on September 15, 2001, as white vigilante retaliation for 9-11. Slide, please. In a much later episode, control and power-hungry employee Dwight Schrute has a replica of Uday Hussein's desk built after he sees a photo of it in the magazine Newsweek. In both of these small examples, we see how humor allows the out outside world to seep into these well-crafted, otherwise hermetically sealed 30-minute long episodic narratives. The global war on terror punctures the comedic narrative and daily life in the heart of empire where war is supposedly happening far away. Slide, please. In another NBC sitcom, 30 Rock, we get constant examples of liberal attempts at critiquing the global war on terror and neoconservatives like former U.S. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. In one episode highlighted here, the main character, named Liz Lemon, suspects her new neighbor of being a terrorist. Her neighbor, Rahim, is portrayed in a vague way with an absurd accent. It's unclear if he's meant to be Muslim, Arab, Middle Eastern, South Asian, Central Asian, and these distinctions seem not to matter in the eyes of Liz Lemon's fearful white womanhood. What matters is that she is scared. She is terrorized by her assumption that, in her words, quote, that Peter Pocket might be a terrorist. So what does she do? She reports Rahim as a suspected terrorist, describing herself, as we see on screen, as an American hero who saw something and said something. And he suddenly disappears. Slide, please. In a nod to the tagline seen all over New York, even today. Her friend, a white man named Pete, who had liked Rahim and defended him, becomes fearful of Liz when she threatens to make a call against him. Pete then runs out of the room yelling USA number one, eliding the actual target of this type of racialized imperial violence that Rahim is subjected to due to the suspicions of a racist liberal white woman. This short subplot is in many ways dependent on and structured by the specter of the enemy combatant and of the 2004 Supreme Court cases Hamdi versus Rumsfeld Rasul versus Bush, and Rumsfeld versus Padilla. As Amy Kaplan has previously written about, these three cases together established the existence of the legal category of the enemy combatant, that enemy combatants, regardless of citizenship, could be detained by the United States, and that non-US citizens incarcerated at Guantanamo Bay could supposedly file for habeas corpus in US federal courts. This legal category and these cases then structure the supposed joke of Rahim's disappearance and ultimate torture due to Liz Lemon's fearful racism. References and jokes about the global war on terror are everywhere in these situation comedies. And I want to be clear here that I don't think it's wrong for media to reflect its historical moment. I'm not arguing that these violences should never be referenced or addressed by cultural critics or artists. But we should ask ourselves who we are meant to be laughing at when a respectable Republican voting TV character is secretly dating Condoleezza Rice, but calls it off because in his words, quote, he's all for fantasy role play, but Abu Ghraib? If the joke there is that neocons sexually get off on horrific racialized, sexualized, and homophobic violence, then the main protagonists of the story shift from those being subjected to that imperial violence to the people perpetrating it, which of course is a classic American move in so much supposedly critical media of US war making. And as my colleague Damanpreet pointed out to me while discussing this paper, the scene regarding Condoleezza Rice's supposed sexual fantasy involves a very particular type of sexual perversion to structure the joke. It comes close to making a much more powerful critique regarding power, sexuality, and violence during the Bush years, but ultimately skirts past it and instead simply demonstrates what Jasbir Poir writes regarding how sexuality is a crucial presence in American patriotism, warmongering, and empire building. I want to pair this issue of perversion, whether sexual or otherwise, and the central role of sexuality that Poir points to with the way that liberals use humor to try and make critiques of war that ultimately do not challenge U.S. military, cultural and imperial hegemony. This is a constant, especially within 30 Rock, as in another scene, for example, a white character plays the game, marry, fuck, kill, and states that he would quote, fuck Osama bin Laden because it would bring shame on him and then his own people would kill him, end quote. 
As Poir has written regarding other instances of homophobic and racist depictions of Osama bin Laden in the United States, the invocation of the terrorist as a queer, non-national, perversely racialized other has become part of the normative script of the U.S. war on terror. These sitcoms provide direct responses to political and military decisions being made at the time by the Bush and later Obama administrations, as we can see in the previously mentioned bit, where the desire to fuck Osama bin Laden in order to bring about his shame-laden death therefore engages not only perverse racist and homophobic log logics, but similarly speaks to a liberal desire to enact particular types of violence against the correct people. Slide, please. Oh, one back. Thank you. We see this again explicitly throughout the early seasons of 30 Rock, with Liz Lemon constantly referencing that Bush knows where Osama bin Laden is, or stating on several occasions that the invasion of Iraq is a waste of money and instead those resources should be spent hunting Osama bin Laden. We see here how even within liberal critiques of war and empire, there's an inability to relinquish power and control. It's not that the United States should not participate in any imperial violence, but that the U.S. is simply enacting its violence in the wrong way. And the sentiment is not unique to liberal sitcoms by any means. Slide, please. It permeated all aspects of liberal and progressive culture in the United States, even in critical pieces of writing like uh, Stephen Kinzer's popular book, Overthrow, that is meant to be explicitly anti-imperialism. Slide, please. Kinzer writes, for example, of how the U.S. refused to send more than a few hundred troops to Afghanistan, therefore allowing terrorist leaders to escape punishment for the crimes of September 11th. At a later point, he writes that worst of all, the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq consumed enormous resources that might have been used in the war against Al-Qaeda and other terror groups. These quotes mirror and feed into the logic of the liberal critiques in 30 Rock. Money is being misspent by waging war in Iraq, and the worst part of it, according to liberals, is not the sheer scale of violence or human misery enacted, but that those resources could be better spent enacting different types of punitive violence. Slide. Liberal humor therefore depends on demarcating the wrong types of violence from the correct types, including the racially and sexually abject and perverse. The liberal uses of humor in situation comedies during the 2000s and early 2010s served as an attempt to critique war making without relinquishing empire building. They laughed at the idea of neighborly terrorists in New York while advocating for punitive violence against the correct terrorists that were far away from the gaze of the US public. They reminded their audiences of what the admirable and required liberal position was, disliking Bush, critiquing war in Iraq, wanting Osama bin Laden dead, but never stating that they hated the troops but there were and continue to be critiques of empire and militarism that go beyond these liberal positions. And it is to them that we should look towards. Thank you for listening to our reflections on a common question. Our several ways of thinking about the fallout of war in a dialectic which moves between the whole and the part. We remind you that this is the first half of our presentation. The second half will be next weekend on Saturday, May 13th, and we hope you will join us. We now invite questions about each or any of the parts of the project as a whole. Thank you. Can I open us up by asking Monique to talk about something that she was asked about previously that I thought was really fascinating? <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, just, I always know I want to collect my thoughts, but um, I wonder if you could offer some thoughts on, um, like, if any sort of television format is able to mount a, a hegemonic critique of liberalism or a critique of um, hegemony from within the U.S. This is a discussion we had had previously, um, and I wanted to hear more of your thoughts on it. Um, 
Yeah, thank you, Jesse. Um, yeah, so that was a conversation that we had the last time that we presented this um, a couple of weeks ago, um, for those who are not there. Um, and I honestly, I've been thinking about it, and I still feel like no, at least in popular mainstream media at the time, because um, even when I was sharing, uh, this is so inane, but on social media that I was going to be critiquing Arrested Development, a friend of mine messaged me and was like, even Arrested Development, like they were so like that was so critical. That was like the biting commentary of the global war on terror at the time. And they specifically remembered it as something that like that was one of the only pieces of media that was making intense critiques of the global war on terror at the time. And so I think this is sort of, I apologize if there's background noise, um, but um, I think these were some of the examples of what was considered critical at the time, but I don't know that I can think of examples that went beyond this or that like wholesale were like, we should abolish the U S military. Like, I don't think anyone was necessarily making those critiques, at least in mainstream sort of like NBC Fox sort of sitcoms. Um, but I might be wrong and I would maybe love to be wrong if anyone has examples, <laughs> but I know we did also chat a little bit about how I think, um, there are examples that we can look at in like stand up comedy that were providing direct responses that were much more critical, um, especially coming from like a lot of South Asian comics who have been doing a lot of that work, you know, for the duration of the forever wars. I always love seeing these presentations. So thank you so much. I loved all of these. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you all came to war as your keyword for this year. I can get us started um, and of course would ask everyone else to chime in, but um, for those of you who don't know or missed the Maru's earlier introduction, we kind of choose a different keyword every academic year and that process is always a process of debate. Um, and there's always several keywords on the table. And I think among all of the ones that we were considering for this year, war ended up feeling like a keyword that both was so present in, our, in all of our daily lives, um, especially and kind of most present, most presently in terms of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, um, but also felt like a, war, a word that was so slippery and both was metaphorical and naming something specific. And we talked a lot about how the like specificity of war in our present felt like it kind of eluded us even as war is ubiquitous. Um, so it ended up being, a lot of our conversations ended up being around um, that contradiction and war ended up feeling like a word that was a keyword that was like especially relevant to us as thinkers trying to make sense of our present lives as much as it was interesting to think about in relation to like our work which might be concerned with something that happened in the 19th century or in the past. Um, so that ended up being kind of I think one of the main kind of points around which war ended up feeling like an important word to discuss um, and to think about this year. I would add one thing, two elements. One was it at various points, um, war and militarism 
were kind of there together, both in the way that they are connected to each other and the way that they're in some ways different from that. And uh, Madeline will be talking next week, I think was the one who kind of either coined or used a phrase of mundane militarism on the sense of kind of the way in which uh, this, that regardless of wars that have names and dates to them at one level, that there is a kind of militarism that runs through a culture uh, and that that itself was kind of the other half of the, the, the metaphor. And then I think the metaphor, again, Anshul, who will be talking next week about nuclear fallout across the Pacific, that I think it was her work and her talking about that, that gave us, I think, the sense that fallout was a kind of metaphor for the way in which war has impact uh, in forms that are not this, not covered necessarily by military history um, or that. And so I think you can see in some sense in the range of, of thinking about the fallout of war rather than war itself as a kind um, as what held this together. Also wanted to just say to take this moment uh, uh, to thank, you know, we started this a number of years ago when Michael Larner came to hear us at the left forum and then first uh, uh, invited us to, to speak for the Marxist Education Project first in person and then over the last few years in these Zoom things. And so I just wanted to uh, since Michael passed away last summer, uh, since we last talked at this, to um, to express uh, my own gratitude and in in memory of Michael, uh, to take that moment. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, agree. Uh, to second that. Um memory and gratitude to to Michael. Uh, I wanted to address your question in the chat about um, Siegfried Sassoon and, and war poets. Um, I'm so glad you asked because that was something that I was thinking about. Of course, there's an entire tradition of war poets, especially English war poets, um, Wilfred Owen being the kind of like war poet par excellence, who after World War I coined this thing called para-rhyme um, that was supposed to be emblematic of the kind of wrenching, sen wrenching sensation of post World War One, um, in which like um, words like uh, what was it uh, like killed and cold, in which the final consonant um, and vowels repeat. But um, what I was interested in is that there are very seldom African American poets included in that category of war poet um, or someone who's thinking about war. Um, and the more I was reading these mid-century poets, the more I realized that they were thinking about war, but in a more sort of, um, in a sense in which it was, uh, war was re-transforming the way that socio-political orders were happening in the U.S. in terms of the civil rights movement and um, being recognized as equal citizens who could die for the country, but couldn't be recognized as, um, you know, equally um, able to have to exercise their rights um, and at the same time decolonization was happening um, and I found that uh, African-American poets were able to talk about these things um, especially Gwendolyn Brooks is talking about these things and I think it's sort of interesting to think about poetry or, or poetry outside of like these large romantic figures like Wilfred Owen and Sassoon. Uh, yes. And just to echo what people have been saying about how war came about, I think um, poets especially, of course, are using metaphors. Uh, and whenever war is such a metaphor for our present condition, it became a really useful way for me to learn from my peers about how metaphor was operating specifically um, in poetry, but also how, you know, um, as Saloni will talk about next week, like the culture war is both um, a larger, a name for a larger thing, but is also has a lot of 
like is an armed conflict in certain ways and is a war in a different sense. Just like to remind everyone to uh, keep an eye on the chat. Some questions have been posed there. Uh, another one for Michael. Wow. Uh, I'm, not, I'm I've been struck by the epidemic of o drug overdoses, Sigma writes, in military bases in the U.S. and wonder what you think about the war on drugs as a failed militarized labor that now manifests itself in military bases. I'm not sure that I have an answer or, or particularly addition to that, though uh, it does um, perhaps uh, too much of the stuff on military labor has stressed its uh, its ordinariness and the way it is kind of like labor. Uh, I think that's probably why I referred to uh, uh, Jin Quan Lee's book, which really accents the kind of uh, uh, the disposability, as she says, of what she calls necropolitical labor, whether that is sex work or military work. Uh, and in that sense, the drug overdoses would be uh, in in either of those cases, a kind of part of that world of a labor which is keen as seeing as being um entirely uh uh in her account uh where the body is really disposable and a surrogate for other people's bodies which is her definition of service work which is a much uh, a very powerful and in some ways more bleak version of service work than in most of the kind of ordinary accounts of the shift from dirty industrial work to a kind of cleaner and more sanitized service economy That question also brings to mind the uh, the ways in which uh, drug trafficking has been bound up with warfare and the work of, of growing uh, uh, opium poppies and, and processing and transporting. Uh, you know, a lot of it originates in the Vietnam War period uh, and the, in which the CIA played a, a particular role, according to uh, work by Alfred McCoy, that has been subsequently well substantiated by other other sources and scholars. Uh, and then, of course, the uh, the so-called drug wars in in Latin America and the the way in which Colombia, in particular, was just totally racked by warfare, exacerbated again by U.S. military intervention against the uh, the so-called drug gangs and so on. So. And and since Javier is actually on this Zoom, uh, though, and though he will be actually talking about that next week in the uh, the talk about uh, counter revolutions in Mexico. Monique, I was wondering if you ended up. I guess like just having watched some of the sitcoms and remembering the scenes that you described, I realized just how the everydayness of it makes it feel just kind of like it goes passes without me thinking too much about it. And I was wondering if you ended up rewatching these or how you kind of were able to pinpoint these moments that have and add this really powerful critique that you did. Yeah. Um, so honestly, I mean, these are all shows that I personally have watched like multiple times, like run throughs. Um, and the obviously the first times that I watched them, uh, I did not have these critiques at all. I just was watching them for the first time and like, oh, OK, The Office is sort of like a fun show to watch um, just to like pass the time. Um, but the more that I rewatch them, the more that like 
the political stakes of the shows felt to really stand out to me. And so I had just kind of like put a pin in that for several years. I just kind of like had a running note on my phone of like really bizarre ideas that I had just like, I'm going to do something with this later. Um, and then the working group is always a wonderful time, to, like, at least for me, to take some of those ideas that I've just been waiting to find the right avenue to explore. Um, and so I did end up rewatching um, at least 30 Rock had been the one that I hadn't rewatched in the longest time of the three. Um, so I rewatched just like episode by episode and again, just the examples that I pulled at least um, in terms of 30 Rock, like there were so many others that it, it was becoming unwieldy how many um, I wanted to include, but yeah, it just became something that like I would be rewatching these shows and kind of like making a note of them. But then there were other cases where like particular scenes, I just remembered them from having watched it years ago and so then went back to rewatch them to make sure I had sort of like remembered it in an adequate way and on the rewatching them for writing this was even more shocked at how stand out they felt and I I've had similar moments like um in the past when I have been teaching things related to the global war on terror, I'll often like show the beginning scenes of like Iron Man to my students and get them to think about how um, it was kind of like everywhere in the like cultural landscape. And oftentimes that one in particular, all my students are like, oh, I've seen this before. And I'd never, like I'd never noticed this, even though it's so obvious. And I think that speaks to sort of like the way that you framed the question in terms of like, it just sort of like runs through and kind of like washes over you in a way that's like, oh, this is, this is normal. <laughs> I may briefly add on to that to um, address your first question that um, something that we all shared when we were talking about war's potential keyword was that war was often our first moment of political consciousness. So the thing that made us become like political actors, whether I think Michael had mentioned um, the Vietnam War, like for me it was the war in Afghanistan and Iraq um, and that it is both like generational and that there are different wars that mobilize us, but war has been a continuous way of activating our yeah, political positions. And I'm in London right now for research and, so, and I did not realize the coronation was happening as I was trying to get around the city, um, but it was everywhere on the televisions um, and everyone was expressing all of this excitement about the end when all facets of the British army would be present for some sort of like ceremonial act and um, you know planes would be flying overhead um, which also made me realize how much um, yeah there is like a punctuating moment of m most ceremonies whether it's the uh, Super Bowl or the coronation. Um, Lucero, I have so many questions, <laughs> um, but Lucero, I was wondering, I think of Japan and Mexico as these two countries that have a deep appreciation for each other. And I was wondering if the if there's like hesitancy to address the treatment of Nikkei communities in Mexico during World War II, in part because of that sense of appreciation or if it feels like more of a Eurate, like a historical Eurasia than than that yeah thank you um that's something i've actually been thinking a lot about recently because just a year ago i was in mexico i was in san luis potosi and i was there for a national convention of nike in mexico and the whole event was just a huge celebration of these like long historical ties between Mexico and Japan. And again, it's always celebrated as like 1888 is the year when that treaty between Mexico and Japan is signed. And it's the first equal treaty that Japan signs with any other, any other country. 
Um, so Mexico being that first is usually like mentioned constantly in the present to bring like that like friendship the history of like oh there hasn't been anything bad like mexico always treated the japanese with like such kindness the mexican people have always been so like wonderful so yeah it's it's that that experience is very different from people like junko who who describes the, the like the family separation that happened when her grandfather was like t taken to Mexico city. Um, so I think, yeah, I, I think it's something that that's why I like the, some older generations, especially that had like a, like a higher class status um, that didn't experience that separation, like are upset at the possible or like the possibility of um, somebody like asking for an apology because it would just make that relationship. Like what would it do to that relationship that, mostly like the governments are trying to keep up um for like economic interests and like trade and all these things that are, are, are very um important to um global commerce and exchange between both countries so yeah it's something that i'm definitely thinking a lot about um and in this case of 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 mexico i think because this is part of my dissertation it's like why is mexico so different in discussions i think like that's becoming like one of the like threads throughout my dissertation is like why is the case of my japanese migration to mexico so unique and like what makes mexico and the historical moment of the 20th century so unique in that sense so yeah i'll continue thinking about that for sure but that's just a the, something that came to mind when when you asked that so thank you Jessica, you mentioned abolition democracy in your presentation. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that in your research. In my research, um, I mean, it plays a role in thinking that abolition democracy is an unfinished project that um, I think many of us are still um, in different ways, either consciously or not committed to trying to fulfill. Um, in my own work, I think there's a lot of concern about that at the mid-century, right, as the civil rights era is uh, kicking up or gearing up, that um, democracy seems to be this sort of um, focal point of race relations in the U.S. and that um, no one is quite talking about it as abolition or not not quite the focal point. Of course, it is a like lethal and um, much more complicated situation, but it is often articulated in terms of equal voting rights or rights to occupy space. Um, and that uh, I think abolition democracy is a really helpful way for understanding uh, historical context in which they're asking or the historical legacy of what they're asking and also if we, Du Bois sort of um this is something he, he coins in 1935 which I think of as you know starting this sort of mid-century moment right before World War II um I don't know if Dom and Preet wants to jump in because he also works on abolition democracy uh, and if anyone wants to address the question in the chat also yeah, no, just to, I guess, briefly add to Jesse's response. I, yeah, I guess in this context of what I presented today, I was also interested in thinking about, as Jesse is saying, abolition democracy as an unfinished project that does seem to have, and not seem to, does have a material force in kind of the social movements of our present, but is always kind of limited by this dialectic of possibility and tragedy, where it was a kind of major defeat of the defeat of reconstruction fundamentally shapes how we even understand the contours and possibilities of abolition democracy, even as it continues to be a core, the word abolition of obviously emerging as like an increasingly important core of the social movements of our present day. Um, so I guess just to add briefly to, to what Jesse already said, but yes, there's a comment from Kate in the chat. Um, as well. Well, I'm 
I might turn the comment around to Kate and ask uh, how you would imagine that. Uh, let me just say, it does seem to me there's an interesting several pairings that have come up here. Uh, legalized work and criminalized work. The question in the chat is how do we contextualize legalizing sex work in the service economy, especially as it services the military? Uh, the the ideological definition of free and forced labor, the idea that somehow legal sex work would be free labor would seem as absurd as the idea that wage labor is free labor. On the other hand, the difference between contracted work and uncontracted work, which is to say that in general, sex workers have wanted to have the rights of contracts and contracted workers. Um, so I think there's a kind of double if the contextualization of that is of abolition democracy, which I take to be the abolition of wage labor, which was actually one of Marx's key claims. And it seems to me still a claim that the abolition of capitalism is the abolition of wage labor. Then indeed, at some level, one wants to abolish sex work as wage labor, just as one would abolish even teaching work as wage labor. But that uh, in the kind of interim between now and that abolition, it does seem that the contractualization of sex work with the various protections that wage workers of various forms have been able to get uh, does seem to me uh, there uh, would be the kind of contextualization while recognizing, and that's where I think Lee's work and her book is so powerful, the uh, precarious, disposable, and and violent nature of this of service work, where um, as she argues throughout that is not creating a, a an object for another person or a good for another person, but is allowing your body to be at the service of another person uh, is really her definition. That's why for her she sees surrogacy as kind of a uh, the the model world for the service economy. Well, if there's no further uh, questions or comments, we can, uh, I guess we can suspend the session until uh, next week at two o'clock on Saturday the 13th uh, and return with the rest of the uh, working group's presentations. Uh, so far, it's been really, really good. We appreciate your joining us. Thank you all for, for joining with us and we uh, hope you'll all come back next week. See you then.